Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, a big thank you to Professor Tao for her excellent keynote speech. Um, so we're going to move into um, our second afternoon panel. Um, panel two is titled Equal Opportunity, Fiction or Reality. Um, our panel moderator is Professor Marcia Griggs. Professor Griggs is an associate professor at Washburn School of Law, where she directs the Academic Enrichment and Bar Readiness Program. Professor Griggs lends her voice to the national conversation about licensure reform and expanding access to the legal profession through her scholarship, experience, and advocacy. She chairs the Bar Advocacy Committee for the Association of Academic Support Educators, and she serves on the executive boards for the Society of the American Law School Teachers and the AALS, Section for Academic Support. Her forthcoming article, Race, Rules, and Disregarded Reality, addresses the moral imperatives of integrating discussions of the role of law and in systemic inequality into the foundational law school curriculum. Professor Griggs holds a bachelor's degree from Northwestern University, a master's in public policy from the University of Texas, and a JD from Notre Dame Law School. Admitted to practice in multiple jurisdictions, Professor Griggs practiced commercial litigation before law teaching and was introduced into the Texas Jury Verdicts Hall of Fame in 2014. In 2021, Professor Griggs received the AALS Trailblazer and Academic Support Award for her work and outspokenness about equity and status issues in legal education. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Professor Griggs. Thank you so much, Zach. Thank you. What a pleasure it is to be here and to moderate this wonderful afternoon panel. And I am so excited to hear from these wonderful, wonderful um, uh, engaged presenters. Um, and in, in keeping with our earlier wonderful um, panel and our fabulous, fabulous uh, keynote address, um, this great group of scholars um, is charged with the topic that, you know, legend holds that regardless of status, anyone in America can work hard to receive a good education on the path to obtaining wealth and social mobility. Yet reality suggests that wealth and status are the keys through which Americans access opportunity and the American dream. So as this panel explores those connections between opportunity, wealth, and status in achieving success in American society, um, and the panelists will touch upon education, employment, and wealth policies that may exclude the disadvantaged from avenues of opportunity. It is my pleasure to introduce our, our first panelist, Professor Palma Joy Strand. She is a professor of law and director of Creighton University's 2040 initiative in the Negotiation and Conflict Resolution Program. Her teaching and research focuses on issues that arise at the juncture of legal structures, cutting edge conflict engagement, and governance processes, and important current equity issues, especially those that relate to race and gender. Professor Strand clerked for Justice Byron R. White on the United States Supreme Court and for Judge J. Skelly Wright on the U United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. She is also co-founder and principal of the Arlington Forum, a civic organizing initiative based in Arlington, Virginia, that works with community institutions to broaden and deepen civic engagement in the area of schools, land use, and government processes. Professor Strand is also co-founder and research director of um, Civility and, and the co-founder and lead facilitator with Challenging Racism Through Stories and Conversation. Professor Strand received her bachelor's degree with honors in civil engineering from Stanford University and her, and her JD from Stanford Law School. And she went on to get an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center. Professor Strand. Thank you so much. Um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. I was at Washburn for a symposium a few years ago in person, so this is a little bit different, but it's it's lovely to be here and I really enjoyed the social hour last night. So um, I'm going to take a, um, a pick up on something that Professor Taub said about narratives, um, or as I think of them as stories, and a lot of my work has focused on the connections between narratives and law. And um, narratives do change. Uh, I, I think a great example of this is, uh, is what has happened with our narratives around gay rights in this country um, over uh, not so many decades. But the title that I'm, I'm working on today is American Dreamin'. And uh, I am a native Californian. 
who has not lived in California since 1984. And uh, my daughter, who still lives in California, recently curated a playlist of songs for me about California uh, so that I could listen to them. And among them is the 1966 classic, California Dreamin' by the Mamas and the Papas. And it starts out, all the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. These are the first lines of the song. And this dreary image, I suggest, also describes the current condition of the American dream on what we might call an extended winter's day, for those of you who are familiar with the song. And the first part of what I'm gonna talk about today uh, about the American dream really centers on the brown and the gray. And in the song, however, the, the dream is actually of a place that's safe and warm. Um, the, the song goes on, if I was in LA as a Northern Californian, I have to take exception to that, but the second part of what I'm gonna talk about today offers some reflections um, on an American dream that actually calls to us uh, calls to us to a place that is, uh, I think of as safe and warm. So I'm gonna start with the brown and the gray. Um, historian Sarah Churchwell, author of the uh, 2018 book, Behold America, wrote this about the American dream. The American dream, in quotes, has always been about the prospect of success. But a hundred years ago, the phrase meant the opposite of what it does now. The original American dream was not a dream of individual wealth. It was a dream of equality, justice, and democracy for the nation. The phrase was repurposed by each generation until the Cold War, when it became an argument for a consumer capitalist version of democracy. Our ideas about the American dream froze in the 1950s. I just want to highlight some of what, what she wrote. Success was a dream of equality, justice, and democracy for the nation not a dream of individual wealth. We are today living out the consumer capitalist American dream, ideas that froze in the 1950s. We have twisted insights and lessons from the past to fit this dream of individual wealth and success. For example, the phrase pulling yourself up by your bootstraps was in the late 1800s used really sarcastically to describe something that was impossible, something that was ludicrous yet we take it seriously today. Or the Horatio Alger rags to riches stories. These were young adult novels for the mid and late 1800s. They offered stories of impoverished boys who reached the middle class, but it wasn't through sort of their own fortitude and hard work. It was because they, they engaged in good deeds that demonstrated the virtues of honesty, charity, and altruism. So, so how is this dream of American, this American dream of kind of individual wealth that was achieved by, you know, that or is achieved, can be achieved by self-made men. Um, that's a phrase that was offered by Kentucky politician Henry Clay in 1832, which I find ironic given that Henry Clay was also a slave owner. How is this current American dream of individual wealth achieved by self-made men through hard work and pulling themselves up by their bootstraps how is that dream working for us today? So I, I would suggest that it's not working so well. So make two initial observations. One is that economic inequality is the background for this, American, this, this current American dream, this kind of idea of rising to the top because rising to the top requires that there be a top. And yet we know that higher levels of inequality actually result in lower levels of social mobility. Economic inequality, also causes a host of other social pathologies that have been documented extensively by among other social epidemiologists, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett in their books, um, uh, The uh, Inner Level and The Spirit Level. We know that inequality, economic inequality makes societies overall less healthy, less happy, less safe, and less kind. So this current American dream draws us into an acceptance of economic inequality, which lulls us to how dangerous it can be. The second ob initial observation is that economic inequality in the US has, has increased dramatically since 1980, which has led to this current American dream of kind of upward social mobility becoming increasingly inaccessible to people born after about 1950. That's most of us on this screen. So this American dream from the 1950s is decades out of date, and it lags behind a reality of really quite limited social mobility. 
And I would say that this American dream really blinds us to the dangers of economic inequality. But why? Why are we so dazzled by this American dream? What prevents us from seeing through it? And again, I have two observations. First, I would say that the public governmental investment and in infrastructure that historically supported people achieving middle class status, the Homestead Act in the 1800s, and investments in housing wealth, these have already been referred to today, the GI Bill protections for unions, these benefits were available predominantly to white men, not to people of color, not to women. Uh, historian Ira Katzelson called this affirmative action for whites. So this American dream, this idea of people making it, was, which was supported by government investment, uh, and in particular, the government actions that were taken to make it a reality for so many people, actually reinforced racism and patriarchy as systems of advantage and disadvantage by investing selectively in who had access to becoming middle class, to becoming, you know, achieving that American dream. That American dream was never available to a majority of the population. Yet one of the core characteristics of benefiting from these systems of advantage and disadvantage is intentional cultivation of ignorance. Um, uh, philosopher Charles Mill, who's the author of The Racial Contract, calls this astonishing evasions, kind of an obliviousness to the reality of the ways in which success often rests on help from public laws, public expenditures, and how that help isn't available to everyone. Kind of going deeper on that, this American dream creates uh, a myth of meritocracy. Political philosopher Michael Sandel writes in his 2020 book, The Tyranny of Merit, he writes, as the meritocracy intensifies, the striving so absorbs us that our indebtedness recedes from view. In this way, even a fair meritocracy, one without cheating or bribery or special privileges for the wealthy, induces the mistaken impression that we have made it on our own. This is similar to Elizabeth Warren's tweet during the 2019 Democratic primary season leading up to the 2020 Demo uh, presidential election, where she tweeted, it's a point I've made since my very first campaign. Nobody in this country got rich on their own. They relied on infrastructure we all paid for, employees we all paid to educate. So if you're successful, good for you. Now pay it forward so everyone has a chance at success. So this American dream of individual effort and meritocracy leads people who have succeeded to believe that they have, have succeeded because of their own efforts alone and to ignore the support that they have received from individual people, individual other, others, and especially support that they've received from the government. And some of our most enriching and supportive public policies, especially those that enrich and support the people who are already advantaged, actually are structured precisely to kind of be out of people's radar screen, to kind of hide themselves, to encourage this lack of awareness. So for example, tax expenditures, indirect government subsidies through offsets to taxes owed, they disproportionately enrich citizens who are well off, citizens who are white, um, and tax expenditures are, are not really seen as government support. And Coincidentally, they are more likely to appeal to citizens with anti-government attitudes, citizens with low levels of trust in government, and citizens with racial prejudices. Another example is disability benefits. Government subsidies, these are government subsidies that support people who can no longer work. And increasingly, they've been documented to support over older workers who, when the jobs that they've worked at and are qualified for have evaporated. And yet they're not seen as government supports. As one Tucson, Arizona headline put it, disability benefits are not welfare. Kind of goes back to this idea of the deserving and undeserving poor that was mentioned. And even more broadly, libertarians who disdain government support are disproportionately white, male, and Protestant. So I would say that this American dream consumer capitalist American dream plays to a self image of innocence and independence that tells winners that their winning was earned, deserved, and righteous. I'm not, as you will have gathered, a fan of this current American dream. But my question, my next question is sort of, so what different American dream, what narrative might we conjure, a dream that looks ahead rather than behind? 
At Creighton, I direct our 2040 initiative, which creates spaces for academic and community exploration of changing demographics in the United States, with one of the most prominent being the shift from a nation that is majority non-Hispanic white to one in which non-Hispanic whites are a plurality. And this shift has the potential of being transformative, of shifting US culture, the kind of who we are, our identity, in really profound ways. This cultural shift can represent a kind of loss or death to many people. And the violence of the reaction against that perceived loss or death has really been manifesting around the nation for several years now, politically in the rise of populist nationalism and socially in resistance to public health measures like vaccinations, masks, to public education exploration of issues related to racial inequity. This politics of fear plays up and plays on this experience of death and loss. And we are very much today, I think, in a brown leaves, gray sky moment. But now more than ever, I think we need to really try to imagine and envision a place that is safe and warm, a different kind of dream. We need to acknowledge the perils of rampant economic inequality and the fact that we all need support and a hand up, all of us. Uh, if we're kind of being honest with with ourselves um, about uh, kind of who we are and 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 that the foundation of the dream from half a century ago is not where we are today. We need to imagine and envision a multiracial democracy. We've never really had that. Uh, how can we dream toward that as a first step toward making it real? Heather McGee, former president of Demos, calls us to band together to claim and create what she calls a solidarity dividend, the protections of and support for ordinary people that are possible politically if we turn away from the divide and conquer politics of racism. The subtitle of Michael Sandel's book, The Tyranny of Merit, is What's Become of the Common Good? So let me suggest that we've never really defined a common good in this country that embraced women and people of color. So we really do need to look to the future rather than the past. What does a common good look like that truly creates a place for everyone, that tells everyone that they matter? Well, political philosopher Iris Marion Young defined justice as kind of in two ways, people being supported in self-development, having the ability to kind of develop their talents and capacities, and people having self-determination, having a voice in decisions that affect them. My own work on civity, a culture of mutual respect and empathy, with, especially with people who are different, provides an aspiration of how we're going to be with each other. This is a mental model for our social system, a touchstone, a goal, a purpose, a new narrative. Martin Sandbu's uh, 2020 book describes policies to create an economics of belonging. And I think we can also develop a politics of belonging. We act out of our dreams. Our laws come from our narratives. We can dream a dream of belonging, and we can move away from this current kind of king of the hill dream that we have of the American dream. I would say more deeply, we need to create space for new and different voices to share their dreams. Uh, in 2019, the New York Times asked high school students around the country, do you think the American dream is real? And I wanna close by, by quoting Caitlin Pellerin, a high school student from Danvers, Massachusetts, who said, I picture the American dream as equality and safety for all with loving family and friends that are supportive of all endeavors. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be on the mall in Washington, DC, walking among the monuments to kind of great leaders of our nation in the past, Lincoln, Roosevelt, King, and as I read the quotes engraved on those monuments, I really was struck by how aspirational they were. These quotes, these dreams were not about consumer capitalistic success. They were about equality and justice and democracy. Uh, to kind of quote Langston Hughes, I dream a world. So equality and justice and democracy. To me, that's what the equivalent of safe and warm. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor. I was so busy taking notes from your from your talk. I didn't want you to stop. Um, wonderful. Um, our next panelist is Professor Nicole McConlow. 
Professor McConlogue is an associate professor and clinic director at West Virginia University College of Law. She teaches primarily in the litigation and advocacy clinic. She's also taught as a fellow in the Saul Ewing Civil Advocacy Clinic at the University of Baltimore School of Law. Before teaching, she managed the Pro Bono Resource Center of Maryland's Consumer Protection Project and also worked as a disability benefits lawyer. Professor McCon Logue's scholarly interests concern economic mobility and fairness towards disadvantaged communities and span a range of substantive topics, including consumer protection, competition law, poverty law, and technological surveillance of the poor. Her forthcoming article, Discrimination on Wheels, demonstrates that high-tech license plate surveillance systems exacerbate credit, at, credit access disparities and revive redlining practices when auto financers and insurers use these systems to score consumer applicants. She serves as a board member for the Maryland Consumer Rights Coalition and a longtime volunteer for Alpha Gamma Delta Women's Fraternity. Professor McConlogue. Hi, thank you so much, Marcia. I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much um, to uh, the law school and the law review um, for having me. And um, I had a wonderful time at the social hour um, yesterday and getting a chance to meet your incredible students and, and hear about the wonderful work that they're doing. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and can everyone see the, the presentation with the road? Fabulous, thank you. Um, and so my project is called Unlocking the Future. And um, what I'm talking about here is, um, let's start with this foundation about kind of the poetry of the idea of the Amer American automobile. Um, car use and ownership is deeply and um, possibly inextricably intertwined with American identity. Uh, it's a part of daily life and culture, um, uh, integral to movies and television, a rite of passage, a sign of adulthood, especially in the middle class. And really it's, a, uh, it's synonymous, it's symbolic of autonomy, dignity, agency, identity, individualism, and adulthood. Um, so, this is really a, a very uh, central symbol and icon within American culture. However, um, you'll see, uh, you know, with respect to transportation, you know, we've we've all seen recently this kind of modern day space race in which billionaires have embarked upon the true final frontier of space tourism. Uh, meanwhile many, many more people are increasingly tethered to ever shrinking tracts of land that are subject to more and more pervasive surveillance by public and private actors. And this kind of surveillance is what I was talking about in my um, forthcoming piece. Um, but uh, this kind of penning people in and, um, and tying them to a particular geography, um, law contributes to that at all levels. Um, First, by making cars more uh, uh, necessary um, through uh, redlining um, or concentrating the racialized poor in discrete neighborhoods um, through uh, refusals, historically, but also ongoing, refusals to uh, loan to the racialized poor um, in order to uh, build up their homes or to move. Um, uh, or uh, only doing so uh, upon very predatory terms, um, as well as infrastructure uh, discrimination. Um, you'll see that, so once uh, folks have been kind of concentrated in one area, what's happened in many, many cities um, and municipalities is that uh, now suddenly the new highway needs to come through this neighborhood um, and, and the bulldoze clean through the center of it and destroy the sense of community and uh, togetherness uh, by the residents. Um, disinvesting in public transit, um, engaging in environmental discrimination by locating um, by, by locating uh, landfills and other undesirable um, 
uh, uh, services and and um, and and sites in uh, low income minority neighborhoods. Um, so law contributes by making cars more necessary, but then also making cars harder to get and to keep. And uh, in relation to that, I'm talking about affordability. Um, first, uh, through sales discrimination, um, which uh, there are laws against sales discrimination, but we don't have the kind of robust enforcement that we would need to see, to really move the needle on the outcomes that we're seeing um, in those areas. Um, for example, dealers don't have to report demographics of the people to whom they sell cars. Um, and uh, there are a number of other um, uh, legal aspects to that that I can get into uh, later as well. Um, with respect to affordability, additionally, credit. The racialized poor are more likely to be credit invisible, unscorable, or have poor credit scores. Um, and this creates a massive barrier to car ownership. And then um, administrative hurdles make it harder to get and keep cars with respect to licensing issues, um, including um, taking people's licenses away or um, being in arrears on child support and other kinds of um, punitive aspects. Um, additionally, uh, the asset limits, like we see in TANF, um, if folks need to get um, uh, cash assistance or, um, or need to file bankruptcy, there are asset limits, um, including impacting the uh, value of a car that you can have. Um, and so the outcome that we see is our massive race and class based uh, disparities in all avenues of life um, with respect to jobs, as labor becomes more suburbanized, um, it's harder for people who are concentrated um, in uh, uh, city, uh, typically urban neighborhoods to access those kinds of jobs. Um, and with respect to health, um, access to medical care, as well as to proper nutrition, um, you know, food deserts are actually measured by um, uh, distance to grocery stores that have um, healthy options and refrigeration that allows them to produce um, education. You know, it limits the choice of, of schools that are accessible um, to residents. But uh, for today, I want to um, focus on uh, um, just a couple uh, things that I'll call out. There, there are so many other aspects um, of life that are uh, negatively impacted by carlessness. Um, but I'll just spend a, a little bit more time on a, a couple. So first, uh, reproductive justice. You know, we've seen that um, many states will uh, close down abortion clinics um, or just have one abortion clinic left in the state. And so for people who um, have to travel, um, it makes it extremely difficult, if not completely insurmountable, to access abortion care. Um, uh, additionally, requirements that patients um, have one appointment with the doctor at this location and then come back um, a week later or three or four, uh, three or four days later um, are really impossible for people who either don't have time off or particularly don't have a car. Um, if they have had to cross, you know, a massive state to get to the location, then um, having to go home and then come back again is uh, you're just creating um, friction points and fail points and making it that much harder for people to actually see through the care that they're looking for, which is legal care. Um, additionally, voting rights. Uh, we saw in, in the, the 2020 election, um, the closing of polling stations, particularly in Black and Latinx communities. Um, Texas actually closed 750 polling stations between 2012 and 2020. Just in eight years, um, closed um, 750 polling stations. And some uh, even very large and populated counties just would have one polling station, uh, making it that much harder for people to exercise their franchise. Um, Additionally, uh, restrictions upon 
uh, mail-in voting made it necessary for people to travel um, in order to, to exercise their rights. And then even in COVID, um, we have seen um, we have seen ramifications of this kind of uh, disparate carlessness. Um, public transit has, in in uh, the era of COVID became unsafe because of the virus. Um, if people used public transit, they were putting themselves at risk. Um, but additionally, so then so that uh, uh, disproportionately impacted. Um, uh, Black and Latinx uh, communities um, who were more likely to be carless and to uh, make use of public transit. Additionally, with respect to the vaccine rollout, um, affluent people who have cars could go to remote locations to get vaccines. Um, my husband actually did. He went to, uh, I'm in Morgantown, West Virginia, and he went to kind of a small town in Pennsylvania to go get his vaccine so we could get it sooner. I, I'm sure a lot of people um, have seen similar kinds of, of stories as people have tried to get access to that care. Um, and one thing that uh, was observed is that um, even, when, even when lots of vaccines were specifically directed to poor black neighborhoods, affluent white people could go and just go get those doses. Uh, so even when um, uh, there was there's certainly a disparate rollout, but even when there were affirmative efforts to uh, to try and get the vaccine accessible to um, poor and black neighborhoods, um, affluent white people were able to intercept those because they had um, they had mobility, they had transportation. Um, and so Proposals to close this transportation gap have focused on uh, reinvesting in public transit. This is misguided. This is a very urban solution that completely disregards the rural poor. Even in urban settings, it's not actually enough to solve the transportation gap. For one, um, public transit is extremely slow compared to tri private transportation. Um, waiting for the, uh, the transportation to arrive, um, actually riding on it to get where you wanna be, assuming there have been no delays, then potentially walking from wherever the stop is to get where you're trying to go. It siphons off hours of users' days. Um, and additionally, you, uh, you're left, if you're, if you're um, beholden to public transit, you are left without control over your own schedule. You are subject to the schedule of the transportation provider. And so if, you know, if, if that's a choice that someone's made, that's fine. But if that ridership isn't voluntary, that is not agency. That's not independence. That's not adulthood, you know, um, in line with what we value as a society. So the solution that I'm offering is private transportation. Um, and making that accessible. Um, in particular, my proposal will be that um, any kind of reparations proposal should include some avenue uh, to provide access to private transportation. And so when I say that, you're probably having some pretty strong gut reactions. And that's all right. That's that's no surprise. Uh, but let's let's talk about those. Let's dispense with some of the assumptions on which those may be founded. First, it's too expensive. Obviously, too expensive. Well, let's let's talk about that. It's estimated that about forty million people would qualify for reparations. Were they available um, for slavery-based reparations? Were they available? Um, the average new car is about $42,000, according to Cox Automotive, which is the parent company of Kelly Blue Book. So that adds up to about $1.68 tr uh, trillion, just a little bit under $2 trillion, which that sounds expensive, doesn't it? But first, not everyone's going to need this program. Um, additionally, not everyone's going to want a car. 
So if the point here is to promote agency and independence, we need to provide people with a menu of options. Um, scholars have posted, uh, have posited that um, the cash reparations, which is the primary proposal that has been um, uh, suggested by uh, reparation scholars, that that would cost between 10 and $20 trillion. Um, by comparison, the national debt is about $28 trillion. So now that's that less than $2 trillion is starting to sound like a lot less money. Um, additionally, next assumption that it's re not realistic, real, reparations is never going to happen anyway. Well, first, reparations isn't new. It was offered to survivors of slavery in the form of 40 acres and a mule, but then rescinded. Slaveholders actually received um, reparations at, um, in the form of compensation for their lost human property. Um, Native Americans, um, Japanese internment survivors, and Holocaust survivors have all received reparations, and that's in this country. I, now, I don't mean for a minute to suggest that any of those um, payments have actually been adequate, but it has taken place. Um, so, and the conversation day by day regarding slavery reparations is becoming more and more mainstream. And it's also true of other progressive policies. Even five years ago, would you have heard people talking about, and serious scholars, talking about defunding the police with straight faces? Um, you wouldn't. Um, and so this is a legitimate and increasingly realistic discussion. Um, third assumption, that ecological concerns are most important. My question would be to whom? Um, let's shift the perspective here. If we're saying that giving every black person or descendant of slaves a car who wants one or some, you know, a scooter or a, a you know, a perpetual bus pass or whatever it is that they want, um, if we're saying that that would bring the environment and our highway infrastructure to its knees, um, what you're really saying is that our collective toehold on sustainability depends directly upon racialized immobility. You're saying that it depends upon the subordination of a large and race-based sector of the population. And that actually applies to other arguments against the proposal. If you argue that our economy relies on racial disparities remaining place, um, if you argue that this would destroy the economy, what you're really arguing is that um, our economy relies upon racial disparities remaining in place. Um, and Deborah Archer, who's written a lot about transportation equity, um, wrote that Black people have been intentionally sacrificed to feed America's growth and expansion, which is accurate. And then the final assumption um, full, that is that fully funded public transit is fundamentally equal to private transportation. And we've seen that it's not for the reasons that I cited prior. Um, and I believe that I'm, I'm at, at my time, so hopefully we'll get to discuss um, more in a little bit. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Conlog. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, um, and this is fascinating to me because of, of your presentation, you have changed my thoughts, or at least you have given me um, the, the thought about transportation, private transportation as a legal issue and not just an economic access issue. So I think that's fascinating, fascinating. Thank you for that. All right, our next panelist is Professor Matthew Dimmick. Professor Dimmick is the professor of law at the University of Buffalo School of Law. His scholarship explores the relationship between the law and economic inequality. His recent projects include a theoretical and empirical study of the relationship between altruism, income inequality, and preferences for redistribution in the United States. A theoretical and case study analysis of the politics of regulating low wage work in wealthy democracies and the role of minimum wage le legislation in an optimal redistribution policy. Currently, he is working on a book manuscript about the law and economics of redis redistribution and income inequality. His research has appeared in generalist law reviews and peer reviewed economics, political science, and sociolo sociology journals, and has been featured in The Atlantic, Vox, and on Labor Blog. He has taught courses in federal income taxation, tax policy, labor law, employment law, comparative corporate governance, and comparative and international labor and employment law. He holds a PhD in sociology from the University of Wisconsin, a JD from Cornell Law School, and before teaching, um, Professor Demick worked for the Service Employees International Union in Washington, D.C. Professor Demick. 
Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. Um, um, and and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I like the like the other panelists expressed. I had a great time last night meeting and talking to the students. Um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm I'm by nature, I think I'm kind of an introvert, so I sort of dread uh, those social hours, especially through the medium of Zoom. But actually, uh, I found the students quite uh, quite uh, nice and easy to talk to, so it was it was a treat. I appreciate that. Thanks for the to the to the law school, Washburn Law School, and to the editors of the uh, Washburn Law Journal for inviting me to talk about this and and talk about how some of my research relates to this idea of the. American dream. And in particular, I'm going to focus on how legal rules can influence the distribution of income and whether they should be used to influence the distribution of income in which, you know, as, as the previous speakers, especially uh, Professor Strand pointed out how uh, income inequality is such a barrier to this, uh, to this uh, American dream, uh, whether you think of it as a myth or, or some, uh, uh, some other more concrete goal. All right, let me try and uh, I'm going to try and share some slides here. Give me a second. Um, let's see. Mm. Pardon, are you there? Sorry, I'm trying to share my slides and I don't see the slides coming up on the, as an option. Let me see if I can deal with that. Everyone should be able to share their screen, Sean. Okay. Are you clicking on the share screen at the bottom? Yep. Okay. Should I send? Should I email these and then and then yeah, move forward? Them, with the talk? Send them to me. You can start. Send them to me or Sean. We'll get okay. them. Okay. Sorry, just give me a second here. Apologize for that. No, we'll make it work. I thought I'd uh, become a pro at uh, screen sharing over this last year. It's been working today, so it's obviously just an odd quirk of some sort. I'll make it work. Okay. All right, I sent the slides to Sean. Apologize for that again. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to talk about is uh, is uh, I mean I. I um, Professor Griggs mentioned this book I'm working on. I'm gonna talk about a chapter from that book. Um, and the chapter deals with the topic of a, uh, intellectual property law. And the book itself uses, looks at a lot of different uh, areas of the law. And this is just one, but it's one that I think is both relevant and, and one that I just happen to be <laughs> working on and finishing up at the moment. Um, I use in throughout the whole book, I address this uh, famous article by Lewis Caplow and Stephen Chevelle Chevelle that they raised in their in the in a famous 1994 article titled Why the Legal System is Less Efficient uh, Than the Income Tax in Redistributing Income. And so the question that they raise is, and the one that I address, uh, but answer differently is, you know, is is should legal should legal rules be used to redistribute income? Or should the tax system be the only instrument, the exclusive way we, we decide to address income inequality? So why am I focused? Let me say first why I'm focusing on this particular argument. Um, the, you know, uh, Capital and Chevelle are both uh, uh, professors at Harvard. They're law and economics professors. They're incredibly influential. Um, and so uh, their, you know, their ideas are, um, are uh, uh, get a, a lot of people pay attention to their um, to their ideas, right? So um, I think we have your slides up for you at this point. 
Great. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how to play them for you, though, where I'm looking for. Yeah, it's a PDF version. It's so a, it's a PDF, Sean. So you just need to uh, scroll through the pages. Okay. So should sh does Sean need to scroll for me? Yep. Okay. So let's move covered. to the yeah. This, there, that's, that's that one's good. Um, um, uh, so there, you know, these this argument is very influential among right people that think about this stuff. But I think it also reflects uh, you know an intuition that a lot of people have that if we're going to redistribute income, it should be you know through the tax system. The tax system seems to be the most efficient, the most uh, clearest, uh, uh, less messy way to uh, address this problem. So I mean, I'm thinking of when the Obama administration was going out, one of the Obama officials was was um, kind of dismissing an argument from a couple of political science professors, Jacob Hacker and Paul Pearson. They had come up with this idea of pre-distribution, which I think is very much in line with the idea of using legal rules to influence the distribution of income. And uh, I just remember this uh, official saying, no, no, we should just use taxes. So I think it's a, I think it's a really widely held intuition that uh, that if we're going to tackle income inequality, it should be exclusively through the tax system. And Capital Chevelle give you know a pretty strong uh, uh, a reason for for thinking that, even though ultimately I disagree. So let's go to the next slide, and I'll talk about um, and then the next one. Uh, no, let's let's see. Uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so in that article. Um, Capital and Chevelle argued that legal rules should be chosen exclusively for their efficiency effects and not for their redistributive effects. That is, we should choose legal rules that maximize the size of the economic pie, so to speak, and ignore the effect that those rules have on how that pie uh, gets divided up. So notice uh, there's it's something very important to notice about this argument, I think often gets overlooked. They're not saying that legal rules can't uh, redistribute income. They're just saying that whatever the distributive effects of legals, legal rules are, they're irrelevant to why we should choose them. Um, uh, so for example, if we told Capital and Chevelle that a change in antitrust law or the intellectual property uh, system would reduce income inequality, but also increase in, uh, efficiency, they would say, you know, no problem, great. Um, but for them, right, the only reason to do that would be because it actually does increase efficiency. Uh, whether it reduces or increases in income inequality is not really their, uh, their concern. Um, so, uh, so again, just to be clear about this, uh, the, the issue is not whether, in this case, the case I'm going to talk about here is whether intellectual property rules can be used to redistribute income. It seems very likely that they can. But it's rather whether they should be used, especially given the availability of the uh, income tax, and given that efficiently uh, 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 efficient uh, um, uh, uh, legal rules uh, and the tax. So it, the so I guess the real question comes down to whether inefficient legal rules should ever be used to redistribute income. And Capital and Chevelle basically say no to that question because the tax system is always more efficient than uh, legal rules in redistributing income. And, uh, and so that's the argument that I'm, gonna, that I'm gonna challenge. All right, let's go to the next slide. There are lots of different critiques of Capital and Chevelle's argument. And uh, the list I've given you here is by no means exhaustive. Um, um, and I'm not going to sp spend too much time on it. I think what they all have in common is that most of this uh, literature is fairly abstract. They focus on, uh, to the extent that they use examples at all, they usually talk about uh, uh, tort law and whether tort law in particular can redistribute income more, effect uh, more efficiently than the income tax. And I think one, you know, one, um, one consequence of the way the debate has unfolded is it has allowed Capital and Chevelle to concede that, you know, maybe in principle, there are certain cases or situations where we can use legal rules to redistribute income efficiently, 
but that really in practice, uh, it's a bad idea. And that ultimately their argument is correct that uh, legal rules don't do a good job of redistributing income. And it's quite surprising that in this literature that, you know, that most of it does deal with this fairly abstract idea of tort law. They don't even talk about, you know, strict, pro strict products liability, which would be, uh, you know, a case with, with more concrete relevance about how legal rules can uh, uh, redistribute income. So one approach I take in the book is to focus on, um, you know, those, these more concrete cases that have clear implications for income inequality and ask whether legal rules in these areas might be able to redistribute, redistribute income more efficiently than the income tax. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So let's come back to the, the um, and let's do one more, skip one more. Thanks. Uh, let's come back to intellectual property law, the, the, the concern in my chapter here. Um, without going into a whole lot of detail, these are graphs from a couple of economists, including uh, Philippe Agion and uh, his collaborators. And they've demonstrated fairly recently that intellectual property rules are both substantively and significantly associated with an increase uh, in the share of income going to the top 1% of income earners. So in, the, in a nutshell, these graphs are showing that uh, uh, um, um, with an increase in the number of patents, which is driven by more fa uh, pa favorable patent protection, the, uh, uh, the, that is associated with an increase in the share going to the top uh, 1%. So then let's go to the next slide. So if the if intellectual property has been part of the problem in creating income, income inequality, can it do anything to, uh, to fix it? Well, to answer that, we have to understand uh, Capelo and Chevelle's argument better. So their idea, in a nutshell, we can call it the double uh, distortion argument, right? And this is a, basically a summary of their quote here. Uh, uh, their argument is that using legal rules to redistribute income distorts work incentives fully as much as the income tax system and also creates inefficiencies in the activities regulated by the legal rules. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, in other words, uh, one distortion is better than two uh, so while using inefficient legal rules creates two distortions, uh, you know, we can always improve on matters by, by relying solely on the tax system and only having one economic uh, distortion, as they call it. Let's go to the next slide. So let me give you an example of this. And let's use their example. Um, so say that we have an income tax rate on the rich of 30%. And we want to redistribute more. Let's say we want to redistribute an, uh, an additional 1% of income of the, of the wealthy. And let's say we want to do this by adopting a tort rule that varies damages uh, uh, positively with the defendant's income. So for example, rich defendants would pay uh, uh, more in damages than the monetary harm that they actually cause through an accident, you know, a car accident or some other injury while poor defendants would pay less. So this rule, this is the rule that Kaplan and Chevelle look like. This rule has two effects, what they say. First, because the rule uh, lowers the income of the rich by 1%, uh, and that's reflected, right? That's reflected in the expected damages that they expect to pay because of accidents, right? That uh, those, the higher damages they pay reduce their expected income by 1%. Because of that, right it reduces the incentive to work uh or right in the in the way economists talk about it, it reduces their uh, their supply of labor, labor exactly as much as a one percent increase in the income tax would right so it's talking about the same exact difference in income but right so that's the first uh you know that's the labor supply tax distortion that i've got bracketed up there on the top right and so that's one effect. The second effect is this legal rule distortion uh, that's next to that first, uh, that first distortion. So it, uh, this change in the legal rule also creates inefficiencies in uh, the amount of care that people take uh, uh, against risk. 
So for example, the rich, right? Because they have to pay more in damages for accidents they cause, they are gonna invest uh, an, an efficiently, inefficiently high amount in precautions against taking accidents. This is the argument of Capital and Chevelle. You have to do, you do have to accept uh, the way econ economists think about these things, which is not always uh, intuitive, but uh, that's, that's, that's how it goes for them. So uh, according to Capital and Chevelle, this second effect is, is pure waste, right? Instead, we can do the same amount of redistribution by just relying on an income tax, uh, uh, a change in the income tax, which only has this one effect, this labor supply tax distortion effect. Uh, this achieves the same amount of redistribution that the damages rule and tort would. And because it saves on resources, those savings can be used to reduce taxes on everyone or increase uh, transfer payments to the poor. So that's in a nutshell, their argument, right? So there's this, there's these, whenever you use legal rules to redistribute income, you have two distortions and that's more economically wasteful than just relying on the tax, which has one distortion. So let's go to the next side and see how this might apply in the case of using intellectual property law. So at first glance, it seems like it carries over exactly, right? Their, their prediction, they use this as an example, this tort rule, but they say that their argument is general. They say that whenever you use legal rules to redistribute, redistribute income, you're gonna have this double distortion. So it's always better to use taxes. So what happens if we use uh, 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 intellectual property to redistribute income? So suppose that we, Suppose that we have an ideal intellectual property system. It's efficient, um, but we want to change it because we really we recognize that although it's efficient, it creates a lot of wealth. That wealth is unequally uh, uh, is unequally distributed. And so let's say we want to uh, say reduce patent length or narrow patent scope as a way of allowing more uh, uh, competition, more producers to enter into. Uh, right, this this area of innovation and uh, and spread uh, and spread income more e in income and wealth uh, more equally. Right. Well, if we do that, we're going to have two effects, just like in the previous case. Right. By reducing the monetary rewards uh, of holding a patent, it's going to have the same uh, effects on labor supply that a tax would. Uh, but it will also reduce incentives to invest in research and development and other uh, innovative or inventive activities, right? So you're gonna get two distortions, again, just like in the previous case. And let's go to the next slide. But there's actually, what we're talking about, at least intellectual property, but other areas of law as well, there's also a third quote unquote uh, distortion. Um, it, um, uh, it by reducing the patent length or narrowing patent scope also has pro-competitive effects, right? So when patents are shorter or their uh, preclusive effects narrower, narrower, more producers can sell the same or similar product or service that uses the patented uh, innovation. So, and more importantly, this distortion enhances, right? Rather than uh, detracts from uh, efficiency. So it moves in the opposite direction from the previous two distortions. Right, so if you add these up, uh, intellectual property law could actually be more efficient than the income tax in redistributing income. And that'll be the case if the net effect of all three distortions is smaller than the labor supply effect uh, of taxation or you know, the, essentially the costs of taxation. Um, in that case, then reforming intellectual property law in a more equitable direction will be more desirable than the income tax uh, to counter income inequality. Um, and notice, right, that this reform will be justified even though it's inefficient, right? So it's not the argument that this is both more efficient and more equitable. It's actually inefficient. We lose some wealth. It's just that it happens to be less inefficient than the income tax in, in redistributing income. All right, let's go to the next slide. And then we start to conclude. I wanna emphasize two uh, takeaways. Uh, um, let's do, sorry, hit the next slide, go to the next one, thanks. Um, and then you can do the next one too. We'll just put it all on there. 
Um, the, just the fact that IP law can be used to, redu uh, to reduce income inequality doesn't defeat Capelo and Chevelle's argument, right? Again, that's the point I emphasized earlier and I want to make sure uh, sticks, right? It's not that, uh, 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 not just because we find a, a law or a legal rule that can uh, uh, lower income inequality doesn't necessarily mean we should do it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily defeat uh, the uh, Capital and Chevelle argument, right? We have to show, we have to show that uh, a legal rule that redistributes at some cost of wealth is, is actually uh, 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 less inefficient than the income tax, right? And so in this case, the, as I've shown, uh, given the three offsetting distortions in IP rules, um, the, um, the uh, answer is possibly yes, we can use intellectual property to, uh, efficient, to, to redistribute more efficiently than the tax system. All right, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I marvel at how each of these panelists is approaching this, this, this topic with such, such innovation and, and ideas that I just had not even considered before. So, or at least innovative to me, because I certainly hadn't thought of this. So thank you very much. I learned a lot and I look forward to learning more from you. Well, our next panelist is none other than the tax law prof, Professor Victoria Hanneman. Professor Hanneman is the Frank J. Kelliger Professor of Trust and Estates at Creighton University School of Law. She teaches courses addressing various aspects of taxation, wills, trusts, and estates, and business associations. Professor Hanneman co-authored the book, Making Tax Law. Her articles, essays, and book chapters appear in top law journals across the country. In addition to being a renowned scholar, she is also a delight to follow on Twitter where she provides digestible insights on the law and economics of the death care industry. Professor Hanneman serves as secretary for the Association of American Law Schools Trusts and Estates section. She's the secretary for the AALS section on women in legal education. And she sits on the board of directors for Class Crits. Professor Hanneman is regularly engaged uh, a, a regularly engaged expert by the media, including the PBS NewsHour, National Public Radio, the New York Times, Wired, and Forbes. She is licensed to practice law in the great state of California, and her recent scholarship focuses on taxation, the debt services industry, and student loan debt. She has a particular interest in industry disruption, emerging markets, and women in the law. Professor Hanneman. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and what an introduction. I feel as though there's no way I'm going to live up to that introduction now. Um, so to start off, I would just say that I've spent much of 2021 thinking about Section 529 plans, which are educational investment vehicles, both in the context of death care and education finance. I know you're all laughing and thinking what an exciting 2021 I have had, um, I thought what a great way to frame out a conversation about micro and macro issues related to meaningful tax reform to use section 529 because it can really situate for you some of the obstacles that we're dealing with. And I think that those obstacles are particularly relevant given what has gone on over the past week in Congress with the spending bill and discussions about tax reform. So, of course, I have planned to speak about way too much. And so I'm going to do what no law professor should do. I'm going to speak as quickly as I possibly can to cover as much information as I possibly can in the 15 minutes that I have. And I'm going to just see what I can get out there. So 529 plans to frame this out for you have been one of the fastest growing investment vehicles in the United States since 2001. They were created in 1999 to give parents a tax advantaged way to save for their children's college education. 
as of 2020, we have about $373 billion invested in 529 accounts. So I would say about 15 million 529 plans in the United States. These have been enormously successful investment vehicles that are tax advantage, not tax incentivized, but tax advantage. So why have they been so enormously successful? Let me boil it down for you. They're simple. Um, I love thinking about tax and death all day, but nobody else does. You don't want to think about it. You want things to be simple. Um, the incentives with 529 plans are really, really easy. It, it is a low cost to get into them. They're simple for people to understand, and they're very flexible. Now, these accounts are named after Section 529 of the Internal Revenue Code. And what I'm going to talk to you about today really focuses on the second type, which is an investment account. Um, let me run through some of the details of this investment account because it's, it's relevant. The framing this out is relevant. So you put money into this account and there's no tax break at the federal level when you put money into the account. You make the deposit and about 30 states give you a deduction against your state taxes for the deposit into the account. And, and there's only seven states that actually have a state income tax that don't offer a state level um, benefit. Now, once you put the money in the account, any income that is generated in the account, any interest that accrues, does so tax free. When you withdraw the money, if you withdraw the money for a qualified education expense, it is never taxed. So you submit the form to the plan administrator saying if this is a qualified expense, and if it is a qualified expense, any income that has been earned on the amount in the account goes completely untaxed. Now the question it's completely tax sheltered. The question is what is really a qualified expense because that matters here. Um, tuition, fees, books, room and board if the student is enrolled at least half time. Now, this is really, really important. As of January 1st of 2018, $10,000 a year of tuition for K through 12 education, regardless of whether the school's private or religious. And there's pretty much nobody talking about this right now. I'll come back to this, but this is really, really important. So the funds sit in the account and they grow and they grow completely tax sheltered. And if there is money left over in the account when the beneficiary of the account is done with it, we can just change the beneficiary. And usually there's not a tax consequence when we change out the beneficiary. As long as we change the beneficiary to somebody related to the original beneficiary. Now, I can tell you that there are no other investment vehicles like the 529 plan that are out there. Um, the Roth IRA comes close, comes close. But other than that, there really are no other investment vehicles like that out there. So of course, wealth managers have figured this out, which leads us to our next discussion. There's no annual contribution limit on the 529 plan. You can put as much money in there as you want per year. There's a state total contribution limit. Um, some of the examples are up on the PowerPoint. So different states have different limits on a maximum that you can contribute per account for the lifetime of the account. Now, for gift tax purposes, you can put $15,000 per year per donee without triggering transfer tax into an account. So grandfather can put $15,000 into an account for grandchild without triggering transfer tax. Um, with 529 accounts, we allow super funding, which means that grandfather can put $75,000 in for five years and have it not trigger transfer tax. 
Now, if grandfather's married to grandmother, that means they can put $150,000 in in one year for grandchild. And if they have, um, I can come back to this later. This is a little visual that I painted up for you as to how wealth managers like these vehicles. Um, if you have 10 grandchildren, through super funding, we can get $1.5 million out of your estate every five years using super funding through the 529 plans. Now there's no limit on how large each of these accounts can grow. And from time to time, we can change the account owner and the account beneficiary with no tax consequence. This can lead to the potential for perpetual tax-free growth of the 529 account. Now, where this leads to is what we call a Dynasty 529 plan that is really attractive for affluent families, not just to pay for college, but also all private school K through 12 on a tax sheltered basis, okay? Now this leads to the next conversation of what's exactly a family dynasty 529 trust. Well, the dynasty education trust sits at the top as sort of an umbrella. Um, then we have multiple 529 accounts that are managed underneath the umbrella of the trust with the dynasty trust serving as the account owner of all the 529 accounts. The primary purpose of the trust is going to be funding the education for all of the beneficiaries across all generational levels. What happens if this is managed properly is you avoid all intergenerational transfer taxes. We're talking about avoiding 35 to 40% that should be hitting at every generation as this money drops down. Okay. If child one uses the proceeds of the account and doesn't need any more money in the account he can transfer the account to grandchild one with no transfer tax consequences grandchild one can use the account when grandchild one is educated grandchild one can transfer the account to great grandchild one these accounts can grow completely tax sheltered and educate entire lines of a family with the money in the account compounding and growing larger and larger, completely tax sheltered, paying for private school education of entire dynasties of families. Now, are there risks? Of course there are risks. One risk is that college, is, college be made free. This would work against the rich families that have established these trusts. Another risk is that Congress could actually change some of these rules that allow these types of transfers to take place. Now, more than half of Americans have saved absolutely nothing to cover college expenses. 529 plans for education do absolutely nothing to help low and middle income households many of whom don't even know that they exist. And I can tell you that tax sheltering um, instruments for low and middle income households, they don't pay much in taxes to begin with. So they, they, they don't get the benefit of the tax sheltering. These plans cost the government an estimated $2 billion a year. There are other ways that this $2 billion could be used. Obama proposed ending 529 plans in his 2015 State of the Union address. And you would have thought the sky was falling. He encountered immediate bipartisan opposition to the point that he had to walk back his proposal to eliminate 529 plans. So the purpose of my talk, I'm finally there, is to unpack two points for you, specifically related to this $10,000 a year of K through 12 education, and also to talk about these Dynasty 529 plans and this whole wealth defense industry. Um, it is people like me, okay, tax attorneys, who are employed to come up with different strategies to protect high net worth individuals from transfer taxes. And Dynasty 529 plans are an extraordinarily important tool in that arsenal. And many people have no idea that they even exist. 
Okay. Now, this became a really troubling issue to me as COVID was raging around us, and I am teaching students about all of these tax issues. So on point one, I would say that schools are tasked with delivering education, but really regularly interface with structural issues that they're not equipped to handle. And during the pandemic, we saw this. In addition to delivering education, schools in Nebraska had to deal with structural issues that included food insecurity, housing insecurity, protecting undocumented students, internet and technology accessibility. And then we have with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, expanding this definition of qualified educational expense under the 529 plan to include $10,000 of tuition reimbursement for K through 12 education. And nobody's talking about what this means or what the impact is on the financing of public school education. When we hear about structural racism issues that have a profound impact on housing, um, these issues also have a profound impact on school financing. It was said on your first panel today that these problems are interrelated and they absolutely are. Poorly funded schools are positioned to deal, they're, they're not positioned to deal with all of the structural issues that these schools regularly deal with. And we really saw this during the pandemic. And so why am I talking about why am I talking about all of this today? If we're gonna think about um, inequality of educational opportunity and how it is generated, we really need to think about the way in which racially biased policies set the stage for variance in school funding. Okay, back when the whole system was created Right, and to address structural inequity in a really meaningfully, really meaningful way, poorly financed schools need more resources. And this brings me back to tax tax issues that I talk to students about on a daily basis in the classroom. And I'm here to say that allowing ten thousand dollars per year of K through 12 expenses to be paid out of a tax sheltered 529 plan is essentially a school voucher program that's implemented for wealthy taxpayers who have invested in these accounts for a very long time, very wealthy taxpayers, so that they can use this money now for private school education. And this is receiving absolutely no media attention. I've painted out the numbers for you on this PowerPoint. If my mother deposits, I have a, I have a, a, a six-year-old. If my mother deposited $5,000 in a 529 for her when she was born, I would not have the earnings on that account to fund her education through that account in a tax-sheltered way. If she had grandparents that put $150,000 into the account, I would be able to start to pay for her education in a tax sheltered way. So that illustrates for you who that, that provision is benefiting that came in January 1st of 2018. You know, structural inequity is by definition really a system of privilege created by institutions like the tax law within an economy, right? And the law works to reinforce advantages for certain groups. And there's no clearer example of this playing out than with the 529, the, the 529 system. Now, as to the second point, um, I'm going to skip ahead to the second point. I was going to get all of you very angry about the stuff that comes out of Betsy Divas's mouth, but I suppose we should just forget about her. Um, and I, I was going to move on to the fact that if we're going to continue to talk about lowering tax rates, which is what you just saw this week in Congress, it is all political theater. It is all political theater, because what we really need to do to address structural inequity 
is talk about broadening the tax base or preventing the wealthy from escaping taxation from things like dynasty planning. And that is very easily done. For example, with 529 accounts, we could, we could create rules that would tax transferring beneficiaries. And that would disincentivize the overfunding of these accounts so that they continued through dynasties of families. We are choosing not to do that politically. We are choosing instead to engage in this political theater where we are talking about rates. And both political parties are doing this. Wealth advisors are paid to hire trillions. And so I think it is very important to shine the light on issues such as this because public awareness is sort of a part of making a change. And I think I'm, I think I'm really out of time. You're on fire. <laughs> You're on fire. <laughs> All right. Um, as I promised, every presenter on this panel has been just, just fabulous. Right? And I could just stick around and listen to these guys till the end of time, possibly. But what is important for me to do is to make way for questions from um, those attending this session, and and even the panelists can can question each other if you'd like. So. Um, let's see. You are welcome to um, put a question in chat, but I think it will be easier and more efficient with the time that we have remaining if you will either, you know, camera on or maybe use your hand raise um, tool on Zoom so that I can recognize you. Okay. Someone, okay, I see, okay, I see two hands. All right, I see, when well, I only see one. Okay, um, Grace. Hi, um, I had a question for, um, for Professor Strand. I was wondering, um, on a, like on a level that we're participating in, when we are imagining the common good that you're talking about and trying to find like self-determination and one's own voice, what are the key factors between differentiating that between like, um, like radical individualism, which often feeds into like the willing ignorance and that perceived loss that you discussed in the first place? You just turned your mic off, Professor Strand. I'm not totally sure I understand the question, um, but I think that the, um, a lot of the perceived loss that um, is happening right now has to do with race, um, that there's a, um, uh, you know, kind of a history of, um, of, uh, kind of a story about uh, an American dream story and a story about American identity that is very racialized white. And that uh, as the country changes demographically, as the country becomes more of, of a set of pluralities rather than a majority white country, that there is a kind of a white consciousness that perceives that as a loss of, um, a loss of status and, and, a, and a certain kind of cultural uh, death, as it were, and um, and that that is a really visceral, almost a kind of existential reaction that um, that is being, um, I think, manipulated actually to a, to a very significant degree. And there's some really interesting work done by Ian Haney Lopez out of Berkeley about sort of race class narratives and sort of how to um, not just avoid conversations about race, but how to engage them in a in a way that. Um, kind of challenges directly the divide and conquer strategy of racism. I don't know if that's a answer to your question, but um, that's what I have to say about it. Yes, um, I, I was trying to get at like the racial elements and um, white entitlement, I guess. So yeah, that was my question. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, I see and recognize um, Professor Dimick, and I when I will follow his question with a question I have for each of the panelists. Go ahead, Professor. Thanks. Uh, 
I just uh, I, I liked uh, Victoria's conclusion, um, the the point about political theater <laughs> over taxes, and uh, the fact that we just need to, uh, uh, you know, sort of plug the holes, plug the loopholes, uh, and broaden the base. And I, and I, I so I guess I'm curious. I, I sort of had that same reaction when there there have been proposals to talk about a, a wealth tax. Um, uh, and I'm curious whether Victoria thinks of that as bro uh, broadening the base or as or as sort of avoiding the uh, real problems, which are the loopholes and uh, and uh, and the other deficiencies in the tax code. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I, I always think, why, you know, why do we need another? Why do we need a wealth tax? Right. If we just change the rates to what they were in the 60s, close those loopholes. I mean, we'll have there we. That will that will that will itself take care of the wealth uh, inequality. I think people somehow, for some reason, think of inequality and wealth as different things when they're when they're really fundamentally connected. So, just just curious what uh, Victoria or other people think about them. I have a lot of thoughts. Um, of course, you can tell I have a lot of thoughts. Um, you know, I think that I. So there, there's a lot to unpack with that. So I think that the problem with the estate and gift tax currently is the step up in basis issue. And the, the fact that everybody's talking about, so I don't know if everybody knows this background, but right now at death, uh, at time of death, no matter what somebody paid for an item during lifetime, the basis moves to fair market value at time of death and all of the appreciation gets untaxed. It's the largest loss of revenue to the federal government. So if you buy a house for $100,000 and at time of death, it's worth a million, $900,000 goes up in smoke and is untaxed. That is the step up in basis. That is the way the system currently works, okay? It is the largest loss of revenue to the federal government and it is actually one of the policy justifications that we have for the transfer tax system. There's been a lot of discussion about um, eliminating the step up in basis. I can tell you that I'm not a fan of that, which really surprised people. It, it surprises people who know that I, they know that I'm very progressively minded. The reason that I'm not a fan of it is because it's very difficult to trace what somebody has paid for every item that they own across their lifetime. I want you to picture going through all the records of what somebody has accumulated across the span of their lifetime and trying to figure that out. I think that a lot of scholars that are a big fan of eliminating the step up have not themselves dug through the boxes of a deceased person as a tax lawyer trying to figure out what somebody has paid for everything that they own of value in their house, dating back potentially 80 years, right, to a time that predates computers. Um, there are administrative obstacles to eliminating the step up. And I really think that that's where the wealth tax comes in, is to address the step up. I would say, Professor Dimmick, that like you, I don't like the unintended consequences of inventing an entirely new tax. I think we know what the horrors are with the tax structure that we currently have. There are a lot of ways to broaden the base with the estate and gift tax. And I'd like to see us try to do that first before we try to invent something new because we're not doing a bang up job fixing the holes in what we already have. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that, Professor. Um, so, and I still wanna make room for uh, other members of our audience. I'm so glad to see so many, um, so many people attending today um, to ask your own questions. So again, if you'd like to use the chat feature or if you'd just like to raise your hand, um, you know, that's fine. But to give you a, a, at least buy some time for you to collect yourselves and assemble your questions. Um, I have one question or the same question for all of our, our wonderful panelists today. And so my question is, you know, what, what's behind the anger? Right. What I see, we're referencing, you know, many, you know, current day reactions um, to different policies, uh, different things. Um, and so I see, 
I, I see a lot of anger and admit it, it could be because of that. I think Professor um, Strand identified it as the independent propaganda of social media. Perhaps what I'm seeing is something, you know, that the algorithms have fed me and, and maybe that, you know, my perception doesn't re reflect reality. But um, to the extent that I see it, you know, my question to Professor Strand is what you identify as a sense of loss or a sense of death. How does that translate to you know being expressed in 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 anger, or, or at least that's what I'm seeing. To um, Professor McConlogue, you know, you address the um, the resistance to reparations and um, the the view that you know cars are a privilege, not a necessity, and that public transportation could 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 replace them. Um, I'd like to hear from you, like what accounts for, I guess, some of the anger in in expressing that, um, and. Uh, let's see, and same question for um, Professor Dimmick, to the extent that IP might be a better uh, redistrib redistributive uh, mechanism um, than the, the taxing system. For individuals who would oppose that and say, no, status quo is fine, you know, what's behind the, the anger in the voices in that opposition? Um, and then same question um, to Professor Hanneman. You know, you, you referenced the political theater. Be that as it may, this play, or at least there is certainly a depiction that I have of you know just this passionate, angry resistance to the kinds of things that you propose. So, so to, to each of you, um, Professor Strand, go ahead. Make me go first. Mm -hmm. um, well, I I do think a lot of it is racial. Um, I think that the the um, there's a and I think it's combined with uh, the sort of, war, you know, kind of economic warfare against the um, non-elite economic classes that's been um, uh, growing ever since the Reagan tax revolution of 1980. And, you know, economic inequality in this country has just continued to rise. There was a period, you know, early in the century or in the 20th century when economic inequality was high, it, it went down. We had a post-war period from about 1945 to about 1980 where economic inequality was pretty low. There was kind of an actual robust middle class. Um, and then in, in 1980, it started, it started rising again. And that was really fueled by, um, you know, again, I'm gonna, gonna cite Ian Haney Lopez's work on the idea that 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 was really fed by racial anxiety and distrust of government. And so as, as sort of, you know, white Americans first started to perceive um, or, or that story was really perceived as, um, you know, freeloaders and people of color who are sort of taking advantages that really undercut the role of government so that you see government becoming the, the enemy rather than um, a source of, um, of support and where government is supporting, this is kind of what I was referring to earlier, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not real support. It's, you know, it's something other than welfare because, because I get it. Um, but also I think we have to all acknowledge that part of what has really happened over the last 40 years is that the white working class and the white middle class have been, um, have been uh, not doing well. Uh, be because of this this um, uh, rise of, um, of of economic inequality, so there's there's actual um, there's actual decreases in social mobility and opportunity that are connected to this economic inequality, and that goes across the board. It may affect uh, people of color disproportionately, but it affects everybody. And so so how can you connect to the interests of people of all races who are who are being affected by this? And I think that's where the anger comes from. Thank you. Thank you for that insight. Professor Dimick. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, I when you were asking the question, I, it made me think of uh, uh, Liam Murphy and Thomas Nagel's book, The Myth of Ownership. I don't know if any of you have seen that book, but it's, uh, they, uh, they, throughout the book, they kind of talk about, and they themselves are puzzled by this very question that I think Professor Griggs is asking, and they, they call it sort of this everyday libertarianism. Why, why do we have this presumption that taxes and government intervention is, um, 
uh, taking away something that is that people have in some sort of pre-social or pre-political way, right? Uh, and, and they never really answer the question. Um, I think if we have to, uh, I mean, I thought Professor Strand's answer was great. Um, it also makes me think of, uh, of uh, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Karl Marx, Capital, the first chapter, he talks about the fetishism of commodities. And this idea that through, through our transactions being voluntary, we somehow think that this has some sort of, um, you know, some sort of uh, some uh, uh, foundational quality to our individual transactions in the market that make them uh, them pre-political, and so that any sort of government intervention always looks like an interference, even though, right, as like uh, Murphy and Nagel talk about in their book, you know, every. Uh, you know what we what we what we get uh, our income whatever it is depends totally on a whole system of legal rules of legal institutions of uh, systems of public education uh, right it's so depend uh, uh, whatever we get is so dependent on these institutions uh, but Marx's idea is that um, uh, there's there's this uh, this fetishism that comes in the market that makes us just think that through our voluntary transactions that the value is a property of our labor itself and not the social institutions that uh, that give rise to them so um, so it, it's it's a it's a paradox right we we have a we're a very individualist society we think that uh, you know what I get what I make is mine and mine alone. Um, but, you know, you think about how interdependent, you know, think of any, right, think of any product that you, oh, I'm trying to show you my, yeah, there we go, you know, think of any product you own and think of how many steps it has to go through to get produced till it finally gets to your hand, right, you know, begins, you know, it's, it's assembled clear across the other side of the globe, right, we're, so there's this huge paradox, we're, we're more interdependent than ever. Uh, just as a fact, right, our economy depends on so many different people, so many different contributions, and yet we still maintain this idea that uh, we're these, uh, you know, individuals on an uh, each on their own island. And, uh, and I think I think it's like Mark said. I think it's the nature of the kind of economy that we we live in that sort of creates that um, that myth of that every, everyday libertarianism. Thank you, thank you. All right, so Professor Hanneman, and then I'll um, close out with Professor McConlow. I came prepared for this. I came prepared. Here's the reason why I am so irritated. Um, we are through the tax code allowing for our own system of aristocracy to develop in the United States. Um, by allowing these vast loopholes in the narrowing of the base to happen. And we saw this really driven through COVID as the wealth inequality gap just widened and the wealthy became wealthier. And we see this with the Waltons and the Mars family and the Cargills and the Lauders and the Scripps family. And you know, we're seeing this trust, by the way, with the Mars family was set up before the generation skipping tax came in. And so it is likely that this wealth that will pass through all the generations of this family will do so not subject to transfer tax. Um, and I think we need to all start being cognizant of the wealth defense mechanism, the entire industry that we have at play in this country that are and the way in which it exerts political control to keep these people in power that that is amazing uh, amazing I'm, I'm i'm speechless professor mcconlogue thanks um yeah and even having had some time to reflect I, there's there's so much kind of swirling around for me what's behind the anger um I think that just the simplicity of a solution and, um, you know, and, and you're right in sensing um, that a, a big piece um, of my concern is the resistance to reparations. And, um, you know, if we'd had it then, we wouldn't need it now. Um, and uh, 
so much of the concern is wrapped up in the fact that, you know, um, those who perpetuated American slavery are all dead. Well, if they had ponied up, um, you wouldn't have to be hearing about it now. Um, and the fact that so much mayhem and just destruction and corrosion um, has been, you know, people have been subjected to this through something that could be really um, massively ameliorated with just kind of like the flip of a switch, right? Just the access to a car, just that by itself elevates people's um, economic outlook and emanate, uh, elevates people's lifestyle in innumerable ways. And um, the fact that some of these things are just so simple um, and so simple to uh, provide and so simple to understand um, and that there is still such resistance um, and not just resistance, but that this uh, kind of subjugation um, of the racialized poor in favor of the kind of um, the uh, larger economy um, and, and larger con uh, concerns, um, uh, so-called, um, the, the fact that this, you know, continues, it perpetuates to this day, and there's still continually new um, ways that that plays out. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm sure I'm going to stalk you all on social media and, and fill your inboxes with additional questions I have. So thank you so, so very much. And um, I will now turn everything back to Dean Leisinger. Okay, uh, first and foremost, a, a round of applause for all of our speakers and our moderators today. Um, of course, on it's, it's so odd to do this on a, a Zoom instead of in person, but uh, certainly we appreciate everything that you've done to both make yourselves available and to be engaged uh, throughout the program today. Uh, just a couple quick closing statements and we'll get you on your way. Uh, wanted to say a major thank you to our Law Journal folks, Zach and Lizzie. Uh, other years, we end up spending a lot of time uh, encouraging, cajoling, putting deadlines out there with our law students. And these two do, did such a wonderful job. They were ahead of our schedule throughout the whole process of putting this together. Um, we tell them that I don't think they truly believe and understand just how thrilled we were with that this year. Secondly, and I don't want to leave everybody uh, others out, um, but you see Martin Wisniewski's picture says American Dream Symposium underneath it. He has been running the uh, Zoom system in the background for us. He does that uh, every year um, without complaint. It is just thrilling to have him in the background making things run and go as smoothly as they do. Uh, that said, thanks to all of our internal folks. Um, my assistant, Donna, uh, we have Ryan, we have Sheila, um, everyone else uh, that's here as well. Thank you to everyone. Uh, what a great symposium. And, and again, thank you to everyone. Have a lovely afternoon wherever you may be. <laughs>